do this. Not do this. Oh. Hi, Holly. <laughs> uh. Hi, folks. Welcome, welcome. We'll just wait a moment for those who joined to connect to audio. So glad you're here with us this evening. Welcome. As we arrive in this space, just invite folks to introduce themselves in the chat. Feel free to say who you are and maybe where in the world you're zooming in from as we as we prepare to get started with our learning this evening. All righty. Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all. It's nice to be together. My name is Rabbi Morris Panitz. I'm one of the rabbis at ICAR. And uh, I'm so delighted uh, and, and honored to welcome Rabbi Chaim Seidler Feller uh, to teach us this evening uh, as part of a three-part series that Rabbi Chaim will be facilitating uh, at ICAR. And I'm so glad that Offering it virtually, we can have really the full full array of folks join us for our class. As you can see from the chat, people zooming in from, from all over the world. So delighted that we're together this evening to learn with a really tremendous scholar and activist and teacher of Torah uh, on subjects which unfortunately are quite timely. Um, as you all know, this is class one of a three-part series. Um, this evening, Rabbi Chaim will be uh, leading a conversation about this anti-Semitic moment on the college campus, an analysis of the hostility directed at Jewish students and of the current chaos at American universities. Next Wednesday is a class on the value of the land of Israel in, in Jewish and Zionist thought. And on Wednesday, the 22nd, uh, third and final class on Jerusalem and the Temple Mount National Home or Universal Spiritual Center. Um, so we have a lot of good learning ahead of us starting with e this evening. Um, I suspect many of you know uh, just exactly who Rabbi Chaim is, and that was probably one of the great draws, uh, certainly it is for me, uh, for, for being here this evening to learn with Rabbi Chaim. But uh, just in case folks don't know, or just in case Chaim needs to be reminded of his tremendous accolades and resume. Uh, let me just very briefly share uh, a little bio about Rabbi Chaim Seidler Feller, uh, who has been connected to the Hillel world for 50 plus years, served as the executive director of the Yitzhak Rabin Hillel Center for Jewish Life at UCLA for 40 plus years. Uh, Rabbi Chaim is faculty member of the Shalom Hartman Institute for Advanced Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, and of the Wexner Heritage Foundation. Uh, he was a founding member of Americans for Peace Now. And uh, we know and adore and love Chaim for being a, an activist and an advocate for what is good and just in the world and uh, drawing from all of the wealth and well of Torah to lead us in our moral compass on the right direction. And so uh, without further ado, I, I turn it over to you, Rabbi Chaim. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, Morris, and, and thank you, Ikara, for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Sharon. And um, I, I actually approach, I approach today's, uh, this evening's discussion with a degree of uh, trepidation. Um, and uh, I'm ready to hear from you. So I think we have enough time uh, for me to present and hopefully. Uh, oh, and for you and you, for you to be able to interact with me and respond, uh, I would say the following. I don't know what the general format is. Uh, if someone has a pressing question while I'm presenting, and I'm open to it, so please press ahead. And uh, Morris, you'll uh, you'll help me there. But certainly, I, I hope that you know there'll be uh, opportunity for discussion. Um, and and I do want you know I I I don't know the, the, the uh, this is a type of warning. This is not for the faint of heart. Uh, uh, Jew, for the Jewish faint of heart. Um, and because I, I actually am going to open up with uh, some teachings about self-criticism. Um, uh, and, and I just want, you know, want you to be prepared. That's why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant uh, as I start. 
um, that I, I will certainly uh, outline what I think are the problems here, but I also want us to reflect um, on, uh, on ourselves. The crisis, just in, in general, is an opportunity not simply to be able to bear down on uh, what what has been uh, how we have been wronged, uh, but crisis is an opportunity uh, for cheshbon uh, hanefesh, for for an accounting and for to, for taking a look and also for preparing ourselves for renewal. Um, it's it's the way in which we uh, we build hope uh, out of bitterness uh, or sweetness out of bitterness. Uh, some of you are familiar with the biblical phrase me'az uh, yatsa matok, right from that. Uh, from the rigor uh, em and uh, and and uh, emerged the sweet. Um, so we have we have to continue to be hope hopeful and to build from that. And I and you know if if anywhere I think that at Ikar we can be a bit hopeful in terms of a building a future. And that'll be part of my presentation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the screen and I want to begin with a couple of texts. Um, so to set to set this, uh, our, the stage for what we're going to do here, and here we are. Uh, so I'm going to read this to you. It's not so easy to read. Um, we found this uh, on the internet. Uh, we actually don't know exactly uh, to whom the lecture was presented, uh, but I've been I've been able uh, to to trace it uh, through my son. We we actually uh, trace the fact that there was such a lecture that was presented in 1958. We have Soloveitchik's voice. Rabbi Soloveitchik was my teacher, um, and this is what he said in, in 1958. The Jew has experienced persecution and brutality. We never had a state. We never had political power. What if we had been a state in the Middle Ages? How would we have acted? Just like the feudal lords? Or would we have acted differently because of Jewish values? Who knows? Now with the state of Israel, the test has come. We are facing the test. Will we behave like any other state ethically? Will we restrain ourselves from engaging in certain injustices, so to say practices, which are in conflict with basic Jewish ethics? Or will we yield to temptation? Here we have an opportunity. The Jews are the rulers. They legislate the laws. They are, so to say, the masters. Will we act like masters? Or will we understand that Judaism doesn't know the concept of master and slave, victor and vanquished, powerful and weak? This is my problem with regards to the state of Israel. The whole of Jewish history will be interpreted in terms of what the state of Israel will do in the next 50 years. If the state of Israel doesn't live up to Jewish ethics, people will reinterpret Jewish history in a whole different light. The question is not whether Israel will defeat the Arabs on the field of battle but whether we'll be able to defeat our evil within our own community and be victorious in this field. To me, this is the most important question. Right, I'll repeat that. This is the most important question. So it's really about us, not only about them. And, and I'll come back to that. Now, I, I, I want to augment this a little. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to read all the other texts. I want to tell you what it is, so you can then read it on your own. Uh, there was a, um, the Midrash tells us about uh, a woman we know about her because she was the wife uh, mentioned in 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 Breshit. She was the wife of Eliphaz, the son of um, of uh, of Esau, uh, and her name was Timna. She was royalty, daughter of of king of a king, and she yearned to enter the Abrahamic family. Right? What did you want to enter the Yifos. She wanted to marry uh, 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 into Abraham's Abraham's children, uh, and we rejected her. So what did she do? She was such a righteous woman that she found the closest possible relative to Abraham's family, right? Also a part of Abraham, uh, Abraham's family, but not in the direct line of descent, right? That bore the people of the covenant. Um, and she married Esau's son. Now, who is a descendant of uh, uh, Eliphaz and Timnah? Who is the descendant of Esau's son? Any of you? Anyone can tell me? Who's a descendant? It's, on, it's in the Midrash, if you look at the bottom of the text. Yeah. Who is the descendant? Amalek. Amalek. Okay. So what's the Midrash saying? 
the Nidra, what's Am Amalek is the great enemy. Remember, you have to wipe out Amalek. Amalek is pure evil. And the Nidra says, unbelievable. We have to we have to throw it, we have to burn it. It says we're responsible for Amalek. Right? So that's the degree of honesty. What I want, in other words, the move is as follows. It's not that we are trying to excuse Amalekite behavior. They're evil, and we acknowledge they're evil. On the other hand, acknowledging their evil is not sufficient. Because the, the question is, what did we do to contribute to it, and what can we do? So it's never the fact that we are without choice. That's what we have to fight against, the fatalists who believe that we're destined to be hated because that's the fate of the Jews in the world. I'm going to come back to this. Right? And that there always needs to be an opportunity. And the Midrash, the Midrash is both about this self-examination and the fact that we need, that if indeed there's a degree of our responsibility, so it's not a question of the absolute nature of this, this needs to happen. We can work to try to heal the rift and, and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Or we'll try. Now, the next text is equally fascinating, and I, I found it an uh, error by mistake. I was looking for something, and then I came upon it, and I said, wow. Uh, this is a text by Solomon Ibn Virga. Ibn Virga was a uh, historian who lived through the Spanish expulsion. So he had a lot... He had, a, he had experience of anti-Semitism. Uh, and in the book, in, in his history, um, he constructs a, some of this fictitious dialogue between the king and one of his subjects. And this is one of these conversations between the king and the subject. And it's about why the Jews are hated. Wow. Right? The answer of Thomas. So Thomas says the following. It can, everybody can see. I have never seen an intelligent person who hates the Jews. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, they are hated only by the masses. Uh, and by the way, I, I want to say something about I. This is this is not a joyous subject, but but I, I, I I'm I'm smiling only because the text brings a smile to me. But also, one of the things that is a dimension of our humanity is that we can continue to laugh even when the the surrounding reality seems to be bleak. If we stop laughing, then we've lost our food. We've lost it. And people who don't laugh, they're really problematic. There was a guy who ran our government. He never laughs. He doesn't know how to laugh. He can't laugh at himself also. Really bad. That's a sign. From the, okay, enough. I guess I'll get into it too much. I have never seen an intelligent person who hates the Jews. They are hated only by the masses, and for good reason. First, the Jews are proud and are always seeking to domineer. This is this is Ibn Virgo putting the words into Thomas's mouth. They do not consider that they are exiles and serfs driven from the land to land. On the contrary, they try to present themselves as lords and nobles, and therefore the people envy them. The sage, the sage has said that the hatred which is caused by envy can never be overcome. Okay, my Lord will find empirical confirmation in the fact that when the Jews came to this, his kingdom, they came as serfs and exiles wearing tattered clothes. For many years, they neither put on an expensive garment nor evinced any haughtiness. In those days, did my Lord hear that any blood, and that any blood accusations were made against them? If such had been made, they would have been recorded in the chronicles of the kings of Spain, as is the good and proper custom, in order to learn from them for the future. There can thus be no question that as long as they gave no cause for envy, they were beloved. But now the Jew is ostentatious. If he has 200 pieces of gold, he immediately dresses himself in silk and his children in embroidered clothing. This is something that not even nobles who possess an annual income of a thousand doubloons uh, would do. I mean, this is what the Hannah Arendt called the parvenu, right? This is someone who has to sort of try to show that they're newly wealthy. Therefore, accusations are leveled against them, which may perhaps lead to their expulsion from the kingdom. In the city of Toledo, so there's a type of justification that he introduces. The apply brought them to such presumption that they struck Christians, and their leaders were constrained to proclaim that whoever struck a Christian would be punished by their laws. In this regard, we can apply Solomon's statement for three things, the earthquake, for a servant when he reigneth. Remember that phrase. It's in Mishle, in Proverbs, the phrase in Hebrew is 
Eved ki yimloch. You understand what it means? When a slave becomes a king. It's a psychological understanding of the fact that people who have been suppressed, when they are released in a way, and they have an opportunity to express themselves, their impulse is to act in the way of what was done to them. So people who were uh, who were brutalized as children, right? They brutalize others. Right? That's a general tendency. A slave who is freed, then once they're freed, they take they 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 really wreak revenge in a way uh, on those who uh, ha had had oppressed them prior to that. And we have to be careful on on all sides. People need to be careful and protect themselves from that natural psychological impulse. The Torah tries to redo our psychology. And then the Torah is trying to re-educate us by telling us that we have to be compassionate to the stranger because we were strangers. That's not the natural psychology. That's an ethical psychology that has to do with the valuing of the vulnerable. So the Torah reverses the natural way in which the world had functioned. Right? The world functioned in terms of power and in terms of people who were powerless becoming powerful. And by the way, that's why uh, that's why there's no lasting teaching that's transmitted in this uh, in this framework because power is ephemeral. Here today, gone tomorrow. As soon as you lose your power, there's someone else who's going to oppress you. That's a system for constant oppression. So we have to overcome that with a new way of thinking about humanity and the role of people, all people. That's why we talk about equality. That's why we talk about the stranger and vulnerability. We try to, to move people to a new sense of self. A second reason for the hatred is that when the Jews came to my Lord's kingdom, they were poor and the Christians were rich. Now it's the opposite. Since the Jews are clever and achieve their purposes with cunning, moreover, they became very rich by lending an interest. My Lord will note, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you see in, in all these instances, and there's a lot more, that the, uh, there was no fear of confronting our own flaws and understanding that despite the fact, Ibn Verga is saying, despite the fact that I was expelled, I understand some of the reason that they resented us. And that understanding is instructive because it can help us really change our ways and, and give us a, a perspective. In Italy, I have, I have uh, hanging at Hillel a, um, uh, a, a document that was issued in 1650 in the city of Mantua. And many of these documents were issued. They were issued, in fact, year after year, which shows that people didn't adhere to the ruling. The, ra the rabbis kept on issuing. It's called a document of, of a decree on sumptuary laws, limitations on ostentation. How many people can be invited to a wedding? Uh, what jewelry can be worn? What about clothing that can be worn? A introducing a sense of modesty. Both because, and, and if you read through the document, which is not so easy to read, but there are some translations done by my, done by none other than Shaul and my son. So then what you understand is that the force of the document is twofold. One, that, the, that um, there, there's a sense of fear of the other, right? We are afraid about anti about uh, uh, somehow uh, nurturing anti-Semitism, but the, uh, there is another side to it. It's about generating a sense of humility. It's one thing to be blessed with fortune. It's another thing to feel compelled to show that fortune, and how to live. How do you live with abundance, right, in a way that's modest? I think that's a real that's a challenge for most of us. Okay. So let's get to our subject. So first of all, the reason that I'm one of one of the reasons that I'm a bit, um, you know, hesitant is that I am a, I am I am an anti-Semitism skeptic. And by that I mean not that I didn't not that I doubt that there is anti-Semitism, but I'm a skeptic in the sense that we should derive any meaning from the fact that people hate us. It seems to be, you know, uh, not 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 the road not the road to go. And, I'm, and I want to lay out to you what I think what's happened in American Jewish life. We went through, basically, I thought, two phases in terms of our understanding of our place in America. And that is, in the first phase of American Jewish historical activism, we were attempting to establish our security in America and to defeat anti-Semitism. The ADL emerged as a protector of the Jews. It should continue to do its job. In the second phase, uh, Ed, Edgar Bronfman, no less, declared 
we can no longer derive our meaning from the fact that people hate us. I, I, I just today remembered, I forgot to bring it to you because I have a plaque at Hillel. When Yitzhak Rabin gave his inaugural speech in the Knesset when, the second time that he was elected prime minister in 1992, he said, we can no longer act as if the whole world hates the Jews. And you know what? Yitzhak Rabin was willing to take a risk for peace because he was able to counter the mindset that said it's hopeless and we, we have agency. I'm going to come to this in a moment. So Rothman wanted to break out of that dynamic in, in which Jews understood themselves as being the victims of anti-Semitism and promote and to try to, to encourage, to promote, that's why he got involved in Hillel, he wanted to promote a cultural and intellectual renaissance, a renewal, an, re, an invigoration of, 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 of Judaism. What was the problem that Brompton was addressing? He was the idea that we would try, we had, or people are organizing their Jewish identity around suffering. Hmm. That's what Selo Baron, oh, what's happened to me? I lost my, uh, I lost all of you. Uh, here we are. Selo Baron called the lacrimose theory of Jewish history. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And that's the theory of Jewish history that says that's a theory of crying all the time. I always say the following. If we suffered throughout Jewish history, how are we able to be so creative? Right? Where, did, where did the suffering people have time to write all the books? Where was, how was all the learning being done? What about the culture, the rich culture that was created? What about this library that I have? I mean, where did it come from? Right? Over, the, over the centuries, we were constantly, constantly thinking about new ideas and not falling back into a pattern of saying, you know, oi va voi. So, so Baron, actually, Baron, who was the doyen of, of, of Jewish historians, he, he actually established Jewish history as a focal point of, of academic uh, study uh, at Columbia for many, for many years. Um, so to see Jewish history as constructive, right, that is the general problem with, with, with victim. And here I want to spend a little bit of time. What, what, why, why, why am I so worried? about this idea um, and 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 about and about victim and about victim okay so let me let me tell you number one victims have no agency one of the things that uh, uh, that you can think about in terms of what we're facing on campus um and i'm going to come back to this in a moment the campus is uh, is is drowning is drowning in victimhood the general culture of the American campus and the sickness has spread into American society is that people uh, 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 assign, are assigned identity based on their suffering, not on their cultural achievements, not on their creativity, not on some essential feature of who or a feature of who they are, but about what others have done to them. So, number one, victims have no agency, and and because they have no agency, they claim they have no responsibility. So, basically, victims can do whatever they want and then say, oh, I'm not responsible for that. It's always them. It's the other. It's never us. We're never responsible. That's what I'm, I'm what worries me is that when, when we start sounding like them, one of the reasons that them doesn't progress is because them sees themselves always as being the victim of someone else. And they've not taken this, not, not understood that they, that they too can make their future. And that's a, and that's a more, a more promising future than simply sit, you know, focusing on, on, on all, all their, all their suffering. And as a result, by the way, Tension and conflict develops because it's always their fault, and it can re and it can result in violence between the victim and the victimizer. To be a victim is, as I said earlier, to be defined by the anti-Semite. That's what Sartre wrote about. The anti think about this: Are we going to allow anti-Semitism to shape the Jew? There was a student years ago, president of Hillel, went to Israel over the summer. She came back and gave a report, and she said, "I went to two museums." And each one had a different impact on me. 
One was a museum that taught me what they did to us. The other was a museum where I learned about what we had achieved through Jewish history. And you want to know what she said? The museum that taught me what we had achieved was a much more inspiring museum. In those days, it was it was some years ago, the old Beit HaTfutzot, the old Diaspora Museum. She loved the Diaspora Museum more than she loved Yad Vashem. Where do we take, where, think about this, where does the government of Israel take people? Where do they, they take people to Yad Vashem? Because you need to know that our identity is linked to the Holocaust. Bad. David Hartman used to say they should take all the visitors to the Hadassah maternity ward. So they should learn on Israel Chai, that the people of Israel is alive and reproductive. I mean, I mean, that's the idea. We're producing. We're constructive. We're not dying. It's easy to relate to Jews who are dying. Dara Horn writes about that. I mean, not too much, I think. But anyway, that's 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 the, that's the issue. We're alive, and we can't allow death to over, a sort of a sense of death to over to overtake us. And victimhood, I mentioned this already, uh, leads or breeds a certain fatalism. Esav Sone Yaakov. It's a law revealed at Sinai that Esau has to hate Jacob and liberate people people who dwells who dwell alone. It's inevitable. It's somehow mysterious, mysteriously built into the DNA of history. If there's such a thing. And I, I hear people say that. I don't know I don't know what they're talking about. Have they looked have they looked around themselves? Have they looked at the Catholic Church, right? And seen the changes in the Catholic Church and their attitude towards Jews, at least in the hierarchy? Have they looked at the different alliances over history between Jews and others and how Christians have changed and Muslims have changed and so on and so forth? It's not it's not essential, it's not necessary. It happens. Okay, it happens. And there's a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, that ha that we've uh, that we've experienced throughout history, and we are a people who are stubborn and different from others. Difference breeds resentment. That I'm, I know that, but I'm not going to shy away from being different. I'm proud of my difference. I think, by the way, that's that's one mode of resistance towards American society, and it's one of the reasons that I think there's resentment towards Jews. Is American society sort of pushes us in the direction of leveling our identities. And doesn't and is uncomfortable with the idea. Unfortunately, has become uncomfortable with difference. It's a it's a terrible error, because difference is what makes life exciting. I mean, don't you want to marry someone who's different? I mean, I, I, sometimes you want to marry someone who's different from you. You want to live with someone who's going to make life a little bit interesting, right? N not not simply a, a copy a copy of yourself. To make to think that hatred is inevitable. I sometimes put it as follows. They hated us, they hate us, and they will hate us. It becomes a type of theological belief. I, I've, I've, over the last number of years, I react terribly uh, to the advertisement for the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. And I've tried to, you know, to, 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 uh, to I've, 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 no, I've noted it, uh, and I've, uh, uh, what do you call that? I've made them aware. I've made them aware of the fact and nevertheless, they haven't changed. Their 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 insignia is an arm with uh, barbed wire wound around the arm. Now, what are they doing there? Anyone know what are they doing there when they when they wind barbed wire around the arm? Anyone? What's the barbed wire? Barbed wire is to fill in. They're making suffering, hatred, the Holocaust into a religious belief. Can't be. We can't, we can't allow that, right? And on campus, what happens is it generates competition in the victim Olympics, you know, and that's been going on now for a generation. I'm going to come back to that uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, most, most significantly in terms of our contemporary Jewish life and our, and our uh, uh, aspirations, Victims can't make peace. That's why it was so important that Yitzhak Rabin said, I'm no longer a victim. And we have to get out of that mindset because we won't be able to, to, dig, to dig out of it. So this explains why I'm sort of constitutionally unable to allow myself to, to let anti-Semitism control my life. I'm a proud, confident, Jewish, American Jewish Zionist. And I'm never going to let go of that, at least in terms of who I am, and I'll, I'll tell I'll tell them I'll tell them, and by the way, by the way, 
That's what Israel and Zionism is all about. We may be victims, but we also have agency. We have power and influence. To wallow in anti-Semitism, right, in my mind, is anti-Zionist. Of course, without this sense of hope, the state of Israel wouldn't have been built. If the people who built the state of Israel thought of themselves as victims, they would have given up. And that's the miracle of the creation of the state of Israel. David Hartman always told us, what does it mean that these Holocaust survivors came and, and some of them actually fought in the, right, fought in the, in, the, in, the, in the War of Independence? How did they do that? Because they didn't see themselves as people, only as people who were attacked by others. They understood that they had new opportunities and they jumped at that, at that opportunity. I think it's obscene to compare our times, which I see in the literature sometimes, in the, in the journals, in the newspapers, to 1938, to Kristallnacht, to 1933, whatever. What this means to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this because it's, um, it, 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 it's a bit harsh, but, but uh, this is my issue with this anti-Semitic moment. We must be vigilant, for sure. But we must not let anti-Semitism be the motivating factor in our Yiddishkeit, in our Jewishness. Look at the proliferation of organizations that are fighting anti-Semitism. When you see that, you know there's something wrong. I mean, because of course, they're all doing it. They're raising money. Everybody's fighting. Everybody, everybody's helping the campus. Nobody asked them to help the campus, but they're all helping the campus. And while they're doing that, they're making it worse for the, for the Jew because they're so devoted to helping the campus. Right? Just listen to the students. So read what the students write. Um, uh, what, what it means to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this, and this is part of the harshness of my, of my judgment. If we rely on anti-Semitism, it means that the Jews are running on empty. Uh, they have no Jewish fuel. Instead, they rely on the religion of anti-Semitism to fill them up. I think that we have to really be wary. And, and we have to be able to dig ourselves out of this uh, uh, quagmire. Uh, that some of our leaders, that uh, I think, uh, again, not that the anti-Semitism is real. I'm going to come to that. Don't worry. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to excuse it and let it go. Okay. The, gre the greatest danger, however, and I say this all the time, to Jews on campus today is not what they're going to do to us, right? But what we do to ourselves. It's Jewish ignorance. And that's really what I, it's, you know, you see that in some of the Jewish demonstrators. They don't, I mean, they, they, they don't really know the history of Zionism. Jewish students who are active, who are pro-Israel, don't know the history of Zionism. That's, that's, that's part of the problem. We haven't given people a sufficient education with which they can, they can uh, somehow deal with the nuance, the nuance of history. Everything in, in these demonstrations, unfortunately, is, is black and white. Now, in addition to all of this, and this is not a kind word, uh, uh, oh, by the way, by the way, just a, I, I can't, I can't leave this out. Arthur Hertzberg had a uh, a little bit of humor. His humor, uh, he had a joke about about obsessing about anti-Semitism. He said, "Why are the Jews so concerned with anti-Semitism? Because they had a fantasy. If we could defeat the anti-Semites, we won't have to be Jewish anymore." And I I, I wonder about the 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 truth in that in that joke. Moreover, what does concern me is I see a psychological phenomenon that's very dangerous, that people who obsess with anti-Semitism and begin to embody anti-Semitism become them, can, can become themselves anti-Semites. By that I mean they hate Jews who don't hold their own extreme opinions. Listen to the people in the Knesset, on the extreme people in the Knesset. They hate Jews. Because they claim that these Jews are traitors, these Jews are not sufficiently committed religiously, they betray the Zionism of Israel. Look at those people. Look at those people who came to campus to fight against, you know, the the uh, the protest, the protest, the encampment. 
those Jews, they were standing there on Sunday already, the Sunday when the Federation had its demonstration. So there was one of our students was there. What, what was she hearing? She was there to sort of separate the people who were uh, at, at one another. They told her, you're not really Jewish. They told her that she should have died in Gaza. This is a Jew, right? This is a Jew who tells a young student on campus. They came to campus to protect the students, only to tell the student that she should have died in Gaza. So I'm telling you, they begin themselves to reflect the hatred. That's, you can't, you can't, I mean, anti-Semitism is vile. It's toxic. If you focus on it too much, you're going to be, somehow it's going to infiltrate and it's going to become part of you. We have to be very careful. We need medications, I think, all right, T to be able to heal ourselves so that we don't become, uh, that we don't become uh, in, in, in extremists in the way in which we express our fears about anti-Semitism. Now, in addition to everything else that I've said that's not so kind, uh, I think it's also important to recognize, and this is just, this is just a fact, as uncomfortable as, as it is, that uh, Israel has a role in promoting the anti-Semitic narrative. It serves the interests of Israel. It activates Jewish support for Israel, right? And we, you know, and, and we are cast in the role of being Israel's defender, and somehow we've been, we've all been um, uh, drafted into the, into the army of defense on behalf of Israel. It justifies, it also justifies the existence of Israel as a haven. Um, I, 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 that's, I mean, you know, I, I also am uncomfortable with that. Is Israel a haven? I mean, that's what every, that's, uh, that, everybody's shocked. We lost the sense of Israel's uh, security. I think that's arrogant. Where is there security in the world? There are, I mean, the nu in a nuclear world, in a world of climate change, what, what are you talking about security? There's no security. We have to try to make the world a better place. Right. So, you know, so we lost our security. That's why we have to, you know, avenge what happened. That's not that. And that's what Israel means. That's what Zionism is. Only. I mean, I know I understand that it's a refuge. I understand that. But that's not the meaning. That doesn't exhaust the meaning of Zionism. That's the bottom line of Zionism. That's the minimalist understanding of Zionism. Right. And we can, we don't have the time now to to assess uh, the, the aspirational dimensions of Zionism and the ideological aspects of Zionism, but that's uh, somehow they're 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 leveled in this understanding of, of Israel as a haven, and it also uh, is part of an ideology that tended over the over the years to negate the diaspora, and uh, uh, and and, uh, and here I want to say a word about that. Instead of uh, embracing and owning the tension between homeland and diaspora or eg or exile. What, what what was the choice that was given was a, a polar choice. Either accept the homeland or you're a diasporist. And we weren't taught how to hold on to both. In the same way, by the way, I, I'm sorry I didn't mention this, we were not taught how to hold on to the fact that when we became powerful, right, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we don't have aspects of powerlessness, but, and nor does our powerlessness negate the fact that we have power. By that I mean our vic we can be victims and victimizers simultaneously. And that's not only important for us to know. I wish the groups that are anti-Semitic or oppressing us would know that they don't want to know that either. Because they only want to see themselves as victims. And of course, victims have no agency. And they want to excuse their behavior, their abominable behavior. Right? But they don't know this, and we are partly responsible for that. That's what I, why I started with saying a, a self-assessment. Because we need to be able to own that and, and, and see both, both dimensions. And, more, and finally, uh, the, uh, the, the promotion of the idea of anti-Semitism is exploited at times, not always, is exploited at times to shield Israel uh, from... From, from from criticism. I mean, the Israeli government's all, always organizing a task force to aid in the campus battle. Right? I, I have a, I have a lot to say about that, but but uh, but but not today. It, it's 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 it, it, just believe me, it's not helpful. My fear, in conclusion of this part, is that we've regressed to our familiar position of being victims 
because it's the most comfortable form of being Jewish. Is there a future to that form of Judaism? Okay. Now, however, however, if you are a student on campus, you have confronted, and you know this from uh, firsthand, from what Rabbi Braus has reported, right? You've, uh, you know that students have confronted vile hostility, insults, aggression. I just today received here, I'll read you a little bit, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a report. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I had trouble with some parts of it, but it's written by the students at Columbia. And I should share it with you. They say they shudder when an activist held up a sign telling Jewish students they were Hamas's next targets. I, I mean, this is, what, what, this is not, one is not very comfortable hearing these things. Uh, right? We ultimately were not surprised when the leader of the campus uh, protest encampment said publicly and proudly, you know this story because it was on the front page of the newspaper, Zionists don't deserve to live. Right? But I have to tell you something. Um, I, I forget what year it was, but I remember when I sat in Campbell Hall at UCLA in the late 70s. And the speaker was someone named Stokely Carmichael, who I think had already become Kwame Ture. And blazing on the walls were the declarations, the only good Zionist is a dead Zionist. And he stood with his, he stood with his guard. They were not armed, it was campus, but he stood with his guards. And I was, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to put it this way, I was one of three whites in the audience, and I, I sat there quietly. You know, I, I actually didn't ask a question. <laughs> I have to tell you, you know, I, I, I know I felt like a, I, I felt like a stranger in, in my own home, and and the hatred was palpable. So I understand this. I understand this. But you know, but um, right? but but I I, I I I don't know. It it didn't make me run away. I am. I, I learned something from that. I learned about a self destructive movement that was going to propel itself on the basis of hatred. And that's what—that's the only place that hatred goes, because hatred eventually it, uh, uh, boomerangs back on the people who are proponents of hatred, right? And and uh, eventually, uh, and it fails eventually. So so we should we should be careful in terms of our of how we of how much we associate with that understanding of what's been happening. But there it is the the the, the rhetoric on campus, as I said, it's vile. It's it's aggressive. I want to show you. Uh, since I a little show and tell, because I brought it along. Let's see where it is. I think it's here. I'm going to share. I'm going to share with you. Share my screen. And here we are. So here's one. Okay, everyone, see this. This is the famous pig that was put up on, on campus in a protected um, zone um, uh, in front of the uh, before the regents meeting. This is Luskin, uh, the Luskin building, um, and you see the pig. Right, we're holding a, a, a money bag with a tzedakah box. I think these are Israeli flags, if I'm not mistaken. And, and here's a kafia, and one on the other hand, um, and uh, it's sort of a beaten up kafia. Uh, and the pig is used here. Some of you may have seen David Meyer's article. The pig is used to, uh, and had been used, the Juden saw in, in Europe to depict the swine. The swine. The, 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 there isn't a more base symbol that could be uh, utilized to represent the Jews. So this was this was this was uh, presented on campus. I mean, it's shock, it's sort of shocking to me when I see something like that. Uh, uh, secondly, you know, again, I'm going to share my screen because I have another one here. This was found in the center of the encampment. A mug and David on on the this is right in front of Royce Hall, and it said, "Step here, step here." So you have to imagine things. Of what what's going on in the students' minds? Students. Who are you know fellow students? They they they're in class with Jews. They take a mug and David. They they've had a seder in the encampment, right? Right. They're, in other words, they're associating with Jews, and they place this in the middle of their encampment. Step here, I mean, right? There's something perverse. It's perverse. It's obscene, absolutely. And and frankly, I don't know what's in their minds. What are they thinking when they're doing this? How deep is how deep is is their hatred? I don't know. I really don't know. Do they just say these things and join because it's a thing to do? I called a student who was at Yale and I tried to understand what was going on. I've spoken to a lot of students over the last few weeks. I had a meeting with students. I want to try to understand what they're going through. So 
I asked him, how, why is it? Why is it that so many of his associates are joining uh, in, in the protests? So he said it's because, I was going to mention this later on, because it provides them with an opportunity for community. And community is something totally lacking these days, uh, right? Because everybody communicates in, through social media. And this became, this is attractive. So you join because your friends are there. Whether you, whatever, and, and you mouth, you mouth the, uh, the, the, the slogans uh, along with it. Now we're going to come back, we're going to come back to this, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, try to, and try to understand a little bit more about how this has developed, where, it's, where it comes from. Let me see what time, it, what time is we started when? It's six o'clock. Okay, okay. Now, why now? Why now? Right, that's a question that everybody is. Why has why has it exploded now? This hatred, this anti-Semitism, uh, and this has to, so number one, the context. Right, there's the Gaza invasion, um, and um, here, you know, the, on the one hand, there was October seventh. If all there was was October seventh, I want I ask you, would we have what we have today? But that's not all. There was October 8th and what followed afterwards. Now, it's true. They were up and protesting already before the Israeli invasion. That's true. 100% true. And that is very, and not only suspicious, but it's sort of in, is an indication of uh, some uh, attempt to manipulate the situation in their favor. That is, some, some organizers who understood that they were in trouble because of, of, of the massacre that occurred on October the 7th. And by the way, among the things that, that are, are most resentful to me is that you never hear anyone from the encampment denounce October 7th. At least I haven't. In any of the encampments. Because they're on, you know, they're on message. And they've been taught what to say. We have the same thing, by the way. We teach people what to say as well in our advocacy. They've been through advocacy training. And they know you can't admit that we did anything wrong. It's not that they don't know that they that there was a massacre, but they can't say it that there's a massacre. So I I think it's instructive for us to see that because we understand how different positions paralyze us and prevent us from making any progress. Because they can't be progress if you can't admit that you've done something that's uh, a hor horrifying, abominable, the, uh, the massacre. So they, they 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 can't move beyond that. So what they do is they revert back into their position that they are the they are the the only victims and indeed what happens they were they were handed a silver platter which is the excessive bombing on the part of the Israeli government in part you know I I I wonder where we've been how come we weren't demonstrating how come we or if not demonstrating saying things about it? we didn't allow ourselves to say things I want to I want to share something with you I'm sorry to say this. It's very hard for me to trust, politically, trust governments. Because governments are, are always promoting their self-interest. So they have to be careful, right? And, and governments tell you, this is what you have to think. I think when they tell you what you have to think, that's already a sign that you should question what they're telling you to think. And I feel that that's what Judaism has taught us, to question authority. And so we have to be willing to, you know, to uh, if we see something that looks unjust, that smells unjust, we have to say it's it's unjust that this prosecution of this war it's, it's not going to work. And and what happens is we finally discover that, you know, when we're when we're in the mired in the midst of the confrontation and no longer able to you know to sort of look back. Uh, because it's already happened. So number one, the reason that this is happening now is because of the war in Gaza. Number two, Netanyahu's dream has been fulfilled because what we have today is a fulfillment of his notion that we are indeed a people who dwells alone. All right, and that's 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 what that's. In other words, in many ways, his great achievement is he's gotten the whole world to hate the Jews. Um, number two, number three. We're caught in the campus crossfire of the culture war on campus. And, and we are, uh, unfortunately, among, you know, you know that among Jewish leaders, there are those who support Trump. We appear to be, you know, a, 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 in cahoots with the American government. And here I want to say something about 
the organizers of the uh, encampments and the opposition, among those organizers, not all of them, are revolutionaries. And those revolutionaries want to destroy not only Israel, they want to destroy the American government as well. They want to build the system. And that revolutionary zeal is always counterproductive. And we have to be aware. Part of the problem in our in our society today is we've lost the moderate left. In fact, we've lost all moderation. We've lost the center. So what we have are the poles. And it seems to me that our task is to recreate a center and a center left. In, a, in other words, a liberal center, and that we, a liberal left uh, movement that uh, that can promote some understanding and a, and a new way of looking of looking at at, at the political reality. Uh, number four, the internet, social media, right? and number five, and seems to me most, in, in some ways, the 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 most troubling dimension. The campus confrontation was an explosion waiting to happen. I compare it in part to. Um, uh, to David Grossman's Yellow Wind. David Grossman wrote the, wrote the Yellow Wind in 1987. If anyone had read the Yellow Wind in 1987, you would know that in 1988 there would be an intifada. But hoping that managing the conflict would work is a false hope. It's an illusion. And in the same way that the Israeli government tried to manage the conflict in the Middle East, We've tried to manage the conflict on the campus. That's what advocacy is. Advocacy is teaching students how to manage the conflict. And that means that means that we don't allow the sort of the honesty. I'm going to come to that. I'm going to come to that in a moment. What 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 we've what we've done, in fact, what we've done, I'm sorry to say, is that because we've managed the conflict. And because part of managing the conflict also meant that we didn't allow our students on campus to criticize the occupation, to mention the word occupation. So in many ways, we've had a role in delegitimizing Israel. In other words, we tried to defend the indefensible because that was the, that was the role in which students were cast. And it's not only the students, the entire Jewish community. I look at ourselves. We watched the occupation grow over the years. We didn't look to see what was happening. People would tell me, what's so wrong? They have, look what they have, look at their economy, the best economy in, in among the Arab states and so on and so forth, you know, the patronizing stuff that you hear. They have schools, we built those schools, we built them hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't see what was happening day to day. Now, I'm, my argument is not that had we protested against the occupation, that the extremists would have been satisfied. But I'll tell you this much. I think the people in the middle would have been satisfied. That's what, I'm, that's what worries me that goes on on campus today. All the people are dragged into the protest who need not be dragged into the protest. The extremists are going to hate us. And, and we're never going to convince them. That's not, a, that's, that's not to whom I'm addressing these uh, remarks. And I know from my own experience, it's from people who are thoughtful and are willing to consider. If they hear that you are not only self-critical, but that you have a vision for the future, that's the other thing. The encampments don't provide a vision for the future. There's no, no one, you never hear the word peace. What would have made a difference would have been uh, Jewish students over the years, not just mouthing the idea that we support two states. What does that mean that we support two states? Have you thought about that? Do you know what changes have to ensue in order to create a Palestinian state? Do you know what it means if there would be equality between Jews and Palestinians? I mean, we have any idea about that? How is it going to work? Have we heard from Palestinians? I mean, did we hear enough about it? Or will we just say, this is our position and we want peace? And then we think, yeah, we're, look, why, 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 what's, why is there uh, such tension? Because we really didn't work upon it. We didn't really work on it. And maybe the Israeli government and all its efforts 
Then it reconsidered each time it failed. What was the reason for the failure? And just came back with another similar peace plan and didn't, there were no differences on both sides. We didn't consider certain elements that I, I recommend that you listen to Ezra Klein's interview with Ari Shavit uh, that, he, that he did. I think it's, it's very instructive uh, a, 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 and very helpful. I want to read to you something that I wrote uh, on the 40th anniversary of the, uh, of, of, the, um, uh, of the occupation. I wrote the following. We, the people who enshrined human rights in our classic teachings, have as a result of the occupation and its ensuing policies become a universal human rights offender, castigated again and again by respectable organizations, including Jewish organizations, Israeli organizations. The occupation has made us a more parochial people, introducing a fearful sense of isolation and abandonment that has occasioned in turn the narrowing of our Jewish vision. The, um, uh, a concluding 40 years ago, I'm sorry, I don't have to say, I don't have to say anymore. That's enough. The occupation I, I hold is the greatest catastrophe to befall the Jewish people in the aftermath of the Holocaust. The settlers and the compliant Israeli governments that have supported them have succeeded in overturning 2,000 years of a tradition of justice for the other and in transforming the Jewish people into an oppressive occupier. The settlement movement has corrupted the people of Israel to the point that the ideals that inspired the creation of Israel have withered and the moral voice of the Jewish tradition has been compromised. Not for, only for Israelis, for all of us. I hold us responsible, myself. Because we never, we weren't out on the streets protesting. We didn't say to the Israeli government, we can't support you. We can't support this effort. We will not support this effort. Right? The occupation is the most un-Jewish of projects. And from a religious perspective, it's a chilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name. We all bear the burden of guilt and can, all right, for this, enough, enough about that. Okay? So I, 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 I feel that we, 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 we failed. We failed. When I met David Hartman in 1979, at the end of the meeting, we had an hour and a half meeting. The last thing he told me was the most serious question, religious question, that the Jews have to confront today. And he used a word that I wouldn't use today, but he, this is how he put it in 79. And that question is how to rule over a minority. So today it would be how to live with a minority, how to coexist with a minority. That's the question. We haven't addressed that. We don't talk about that. That's the issue we need. In other words, in, in light of this crisis, we, we need to fend off the anti-Semites, identify them, right? We need to, right? It, it, whatever, with, a, with the correct means, all right? Uh, absolutely. And we have organizations. I mean, there is the, I mean, I come back to the ADL. That's its main job. I don't know why we need another hundred organizations, okay, to do this, to do this, uh, if, if, if people could work together, okay. But apart from that, we have to do some building, rebuilding, and look for opportunities. Do you know that every week on campus, there's a group of Israelis and Palestinians who sit together in Omdim Biachad, and they, they, they sit at a table, that's what we need to be able to do. Let people know that there's an option. Let people know that Israelis, Jews, and Palestinians actually talk to one another. Nobody knows that. Because all they know is Netanyahu and his government and bombs. Right? So they don't know the, they don't know the, the they don't know they're not aware of the of the of the human dimension. Okay. Now, the most profound example of delegitimization that I want to add to my to my list is an argument that was made. Unfortunately, it's still being made. And that argument was early on in the settlement movement that uh, Ofra or Tekoa, let's say, Tekoa was Haifa. Now, Tekoa is a settlement and Haifa is a city in Israel, in the pre-67 boundaries of Israel, right? So the, what, what, what's the problem here? If Tekoa is, a, is legitimate, okay. But if the world considers Tekoa to be illegitimate, then the people who argue that the Koa is Haifa are basically arguing that Haifa is illegitimate, which means that Jews are part of the argument against Israel. The delegitimization of Israel is a function of a Jewish argument that the settlements are the same thing as Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Major mistake. And it's time for us to own up. Now, how did this all come about, this alienation? We were, that is, the, uh, at a place like UCLA, the joke was always, Jew CLA. 
that you know Jews were comfortable there, and even when the numbers of Jews declined because of uh, all sorts of uh, objective, there, I mean, there were reasons that that happened. Nevertheless, the university has been a comfortable environment for Jews. I would still make that argument that we are at the tail end of a golden age. We're not going to see it in the future. Look at all the administrators. I mean, look at uh, look 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 at the boards of the of universities. Uh, look at the professors. Still, the professoriate, uh, and and Jews are still a a, a disproportionate uh, uh, disproportionate. Uh, part of, uh, of of elite of elite of elite schools. So what happened? What happened? So what changed over the years? And here I'm going to try to understand the nature of the of the hostility. All right. Number one, things began to change in 1967. Uh, uh, there's some of you here, I think, who might remember that. Some of you who don't. Right? What changed in 1967? We were victors in 1967. Right? Not only were we victors. Right. We we actually it, it was a, it was an overwhelming victory, uh, and um, the the we 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 really displayed a power that was un, that was unexpected, and the left couldn't tolerate the Jewish underdog becoming the superhero, and the left began its assault on the legitimacy of Israel. The the what what was what was initiated in 1967 we are feeling today and we should have been alert to it and taken it seriously, right? And offer and offer an option, an alternative, which meant a leftist alternative which was not extreme, because that left that left became re revolutionary. And we were part, and so though, there were Jews who were part of the revolution, the anti-war movement, and so on. This was the remnant of the anti-war movement. And it was a movement that didn't trust America. The Israel that won in 1967 was an Israel aligned with the American government. And the left looked upon us as being traif because of our association with power, with oppression, with the, with the America, M-A-E-R-I-K-A, -E right? The, oppre the, oppressive, the oppressive America, number one. Number two, I saw things change before my eyes in 1982. What happened in 1982? Anybody remember? Right, it was the first time that Israel engaged in an offensive, aggressive war when we in, when we invaded Lebanon and we bombed we bombed Beirut. And Menachem Begin said that Beirut was Warsaw. It was I don't know I, you know, I don't know what he was thinking, uh, or that you know tried to invoke the Holocaust in some way, in in terms of the need for this bombing of bombing of innocents. Uh, and the world turned on us. On campus, there was a demonstration. There was a speaker, a Palestinian speaker. Um, we knew him. He was very active. He was married to a Jewish woman. I mean, and there was there were conversations always happening in those days. And I came to this demonstration, and what I saw to me was tragic, because I saw all the ethnic groups that had been the allies of the Jews line up behind the Palestinians, and the Jewish students who were in student government were hanging out the windows of Kirchhoff Hall on campus, the, the student government building, and there were tears in their eyes. I was crying, because I watched with my own eyes, I saw the, I saw the coalition crumble, meaning the, the, the progressive coalition that had been built over the years of people who understood one another and who were looking, who were looking for a new future. So, and what happened as a result of 1982, of this confrontation, where did the Jews go since they lost their allies? Uh, they lost their allies in the ethnic groups. The Jews began to ally with the uh, fraternities and the sororities. Same fraternities and sororities that were once anti-Semitic, the Jews became very prominent in those same fraternities and sororities. Who are the fraternities and sororities? They're looked upon on campus as being uh, as being part of, uh, of of the oppressive class. I'll will come to that. I'll come to that in a moment because there's something that something changed in terms of Jew Jewish identity and what it is. Then in 1991, I remember the following: uh, there was an advertisement. For a multiculturalism conference in uh, in New Orleans, I really wanted to go. I, I I wanted to hear the music, and those were the years in which there was tension between blacks and Jews on campus. So I presented two proposals to the multicultural committee to make presentations, and I both both of them were rejected on the grounds that Jews were not part of the multicultural agenda. But I really wanted to hear the music, so uh, I appealed. And they accepted my finally accepted my proposal and made my presentation. Uh, although it didn't, in any way, I didn't feel that they 
significantly address the issue of why they were excluding Jews, but I saw something that's very instructive in terms of the present day. Uh, I came back to my room in the hotel and Doreen asked me how it was. I said, you know, Doreen, it was a, sort of amazing. There were 3,000 people at this conference. And I asked, who are all these 3,000 people? Those 3,000 people were a new group of mid-level administrators that were beginning to take positions at the university that had to deal with multiculturalism and with all the ethnic groups and their grievances and their desire for uh, retention and the uh, and and somehow addressing the, the needs of those ethnic communities. Now, they were not bad people, and the desire and the needs were, were legitimate, were legitimate. However, it was about creating a separate class at the university of victims whose basic understanding was that we want this, we want to be, we, we want somehow to redress, redress our uh, our victimhood in, in, in ways and appeals constantly against those who are oppressing us. Who is oppressing them? The whites are oppressing the victims. Now, who are the Jews in this context? Now, the moving the Jews, let, let me back up for a moment. I think it's it's important to understand that multiculturalism carried with it a great deal of promise because what it said was we had only been exposed to a slice of the American world and didn't understand the range of what America of what America was what it had achieved and the inclusive aspect was very promising because each culture brought something different so you look to multiculturalism as something creative you wanted to be exposed to someone else's culture. What you did, what I didn't want is to be exposed to the fact that they suffered more than I did. That didn't attract me. I'm, I need to know the history. I don't want to deny the history. I'm not, a, I'm not a racist. I know that some people think that this argument is somehow racist. But it's not, it doesn't give value. Their victimhood doesn't give value. What their victimhood does is it sets them up against the other and sets, sets people up against, against one another because there's the oppressor and there's the oppressed. And we, who had been victims, had moved out of that class, and the university, in some ways, was responsible for helping, to re helping for redefining us. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, Jews became whites. I say this many times. I grew up in Donald Park in Brooklyn. No one ever told me that I was a Caucasian. This is a Caucasian. I mean, I, really, I didn't know what that meant. I was, I was, a, I was a Jew. If you ask me for my identity, I'm, I, I, I think that the categorization of Title IX, of all these requirements that you have to fill out your ethnic identification, has resulted, unfortunately, in a re-racialization of American discourse, of social discourse, and of politics. And it's very negative. And to me, it's, uh, it's, it's what's at the heart of the problem that we're confronting at the university today, that the university has contributed in setting people up against one another. In their, diff in their different groups. Really, I don't think they did it purposely, obviously. But this is a result of what we faced and out of what the multicultural agenda and the 3,000 administrators that we had who now have a program called DEI, which is part of every, every faculty, right? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you can't be hired if you don't, if you don't fill out a DEI questionnaire or something like that. And, and it, 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 it's sort of an oppressive uh, overlay and more than anything else, it's it, more than anything else. The way in which DNI is DEI is deployed has caused a lot of the maybe all of the problems that we face in terms of the confrontation between students. Now, what are the Jews? What what what's the Jewish response to the abuse of DEI? You know what the response is, right? What you what you imagine? We should be part of DEI also, but DEI is the but the way in which DEI is utilized is the problem. Don't say, don't ask for a solution that's going to only, it seems to me, exacerbate the problem. DEI has to be transformed. I'm not out to, to junk it. I'm not, it doesn't, it need not be thrown away. There are important values there, but it can't be used as this sort of negative, negative tool and an exclusive, an, an exclusionary tool. And unfortunately, that's what, that's what we've seen. So the Jews have been reclassified as whites, were looked upon as oppressors, and the university has participated in what I would call a in in in, in, the, in defining us. I think I by the way, I I, I think that it's a, a a major a major violation. A major violation to be uh, to 
um, for the university to define us. I, Jews should be allowed to define themselves. The complication, of course, is many Jews like it. They like being classified as whites. They want and they want to have it both ways. They, and that's part of the tragedy of what they're confronting. They want to still be considered victims while they are, in fact, people of power. And they don't acknowledge that part of who they are. So it's not true that because we're white, we're the white oppressors. It's more complicated. But com complexity is not part of university demonstrations, right? There's no complexity in, black, in, the, in the confrontation. The, but we have a responsibility to introduce a degree of complexity and to challenge, to challenge some of these definitions. And we need to acknowledge we made it. We made it. Look around the university. Look at all the buildings named you know, with, 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 with Jewish names. I mean, well, the, stu the students know that. The students know that the chancellor is Jewish. All right. So there have been two major changes in, Jew in Jewish experience uh, uh, in the last generation. Money and power. We're, we're the most affluent community in America, and we have enormous influence. And it, and it doesn't pay, it, it, it doesn't work to shush around, don't say that. It's true. The best thing would be to talk about it, if only amongst ourselves and even with others. I mean, we have to be able to, to, to deal with it. What it's bred, in my mind, is what I call, I know people, people use the term anti-Semitism. I sometimes prefer anti-Jewish, but I would call it is, I call it a politics of resentment. This is back to Ibn Virga. The Jews are resented. Why are we resented? We resented because we were once part of them. And somehow we were able to climb out of it. And in, the, in our process of climbing out of it, we didn't look back, most of us. I mean, you're in a congregation that does look back, but that's not, that's not emblematic of where the Jewish community is at, right? And that's what happens, Natu it's, nat it's sort of natural that it happens that way. But because we shared, we shared, we had a shared language, with the people who are now against us, there's something sort of the, a tragedy occurred in which we lost we lost that connection, and we didn't we were not we were not alert to what we were losing in the process because we thought that we could get along without it, and we forgot that what we need to be able to do as Jews as Americans is preserve the sense of the entire community. Maybe that's our task because nobody else is doing it. By the way, that's been lost on campus today. The sense of the all. Everybody is out for themselves. All the groups are out for themselves. And they can't look beyond their noses. The problem is we do the same thing. So we, we need to regenerate that notion on the campus of the, general of the general community. Let me read you what I wrote in a paper that I published. My contention is that the vehemence of the anti-Israel activism is largely a cover for the more insidious and personal envy and resentment that is the currency of the powerless and the marginalized. Precisely because it is so obviously the best of times for Jews who had in the past suffered indignity and persecution, those who are still struggling against prejudice and discrimination and still seeking recognition are determined to make it the worst of times for us. It is the concrete display of Jewish national power by Israel in alliance with the despised American superpower and the very fulfillment of the Jewish, of Jewish dreams in the establishment and international recognition of the Jewish homeland, uh, quote, from them, they even have a state of their own, as well as the stately architecture of the many imposing and well-endowed hill facilities that proliferate across the country that arouse envy and the suspicion that the Jews, through their connections, have manipulated their way to the top. We are seen as dominating the university. Just look at the Jewish administrators, etc., etc. Hence, according to the perverse rules of the victim discourse, Jewish students have forfeited the right to claim that they are victims of anti-Semitism since they are now considered among the privileged. And all of the genuine victims, the coalition of oppressed minorities, most of whom have no particular interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, feel compelled by intersectional logic and political alliance to denounce the immoral and oppressive actions of the Jewish state because the latter is viewed as the ultimate symbol of excessive Jewish power. And so that's, that's, in a sense, what I consider to be the illness, the illness that we've, uh, that we've confronted on campus. And, uh, I, I, and what I would say is there's a similarity between the extreme on the left and the extreme on the right. The extreme on the right uh, chanted, Jews will not replace us. The extreme on the left 
is saying, we will replace the Jews. That's what's going on on campus. The Jews hold themselves out to be moral. They hold themselves out to be exceptional. We're out to take them down from their position because that, because whatever, whatever reasons, because of this, because of this sort of conflict ridden understanding of the nature of the, of the dynamic, of the dynamic relationship. Now I want to spend a few minutes uh, just uh, suggesting uh, what, what can be done and then take some questions. I mean, I'll do it quickly. All right, so that we can get to uh, have at least 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of question. What can be done? Number one, Jewish students and the community should be taught that we should be mouthing a, a chanting that we are pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian. Right? We need to make that a reality, even in, amidst the, this conflict, and that uh, the two states, whatever it is, whatever solution we have, whatever vision we have, is not only helpful for the Palestinians, it's not only what the Palestinians want. And by the way, that's something that doesn't emerge out of these encampments. The encampments don't know what the Palestinians on the ground really want. Most Palestinians on the ground hold on to their nationalism. They're not willing to give up their nationalism. They want a state of their own. Well, if they want a state of their own, then we should have a state of their own, of our own. I listened to this student who was, who was going to be the um, uh, the, uh, the valedictorian at USC when she was interviewed on MSNBC, and she was asked, your Instagram account linked you to a pronouncement of the, of the abolishment of the state of Israel. Do you believe in the abolishment of the state of Israel? And she hemmed and hawed and said, and then the, the interviewer said, what do you think, what do you think about abolishment? And again, she said, I believe in the abolishment of the apartheid state of Israel. So what does that mean? Abolishment. Abolishment? Well, that means that we're going to destroy. How do you destroy a state without violence? So all these people who are anti-violence and they're complaining and they're protesting against Israeli violence, they're promoting the violence of Hamas. Right? So uh, uh, on the other side. So number one, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine. Number two, we, and again, I'm, I'm suggesting things. We can talk at length about these suggestions another time. We have to sort of reinvigorate the, the conversation about pluralism as a goal in America. Because the pluralistic goal and the significance of pluralism is that what it does is teaches you you can be for yourself and for others simultaneously. Nobody knows that. Everybody thinks it's they're incompatible. You can only be one or the other. This is, a, this is the way Jews have lived throughout centuries. We understand that there's a particularity and there's a universal dimension to our Jewishness. And it's possible. And we don't have to trade off one for the other. That's what's happening now. We're being asked by certain people and leaders to become pro-Jewish and forget about the fact that we have to be pro-other, number two. Number three, we have to return to a positive multiculturalism where, where multiculturalism is a celebration of the diversity of cultures and not pitting one culture against another. Number four, we have to study the ill effects of a victim culture. I, I don't know that anybody's done, I've been asking professors, anybody study the psychological consequences of teaching people that they're victims? Because in the way they're teaching people to hate themselves. If you learn that the Jewish people are the Holocaust people, so why would you want to be a Jew? I mean, I would opt out. If my fate is that everyone's going to hate me, I, I, I've had enough, all right? Number, number four, no, uh, whatever, number five, nurture dialogue. Nurture dialogue. We have to overcome the principle on campus, and it's from both sides, th that's, that's so uh, insidious. Anti-normalization. Do you know that? The other side says, what does it say? We can't talk to people who are Zionists. We can't talk to organizations that have association with Zionists. And we say, we can't talk to people who support BDS. We can't talk to organizations that have people who support, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a plague on both your houses. We have to get beyond the advocacy. Advocacy education is an education of confrontation. Education, uh, 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 constructive education, teaches people to look for one another. We have to be able to create opportunities for people from different communities to see each other's faces. They don't know what each other looks like. They have no, they don't have relationships. That's how you defeat paranoia and how you defeat hatred. When people see the humanity of their fellow, we don't do that. And the university, I'm sorry to say, is guilty here in not, in not being able, 
uh, to do that. We have to rescind the Hillel uh, decree against it, its own type of Jewish, what I said, and not talking to BDS, et cetera, et cetera. There should be a debate in, in, in Hillel uh, about, about BDS, about whether there should be two states and what it means. I haven't heard those conversations in years going on within, within a, a Jewish context. Uh, we need for campus to, to live in peace. I'm sorry to say, we have to tell the community to, to stay out and keep out. The community only messes up what's going on on campus and, and makes it worse. And finally, we have to make it clear that legislation is counterproductive. And we can talk about that because now there's an anti-Semitism awareness uh, bill that in, in Congress, uh, they, uh, read Michelle Goldberg's column in, uh, in uh, today in, in the New York Times. But I mean, it's, 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 it's problematic for me. All the effort at legislation. You don't legislate prejudice away. You have to give people an opportunity to learn about one another. The prejudice... The pre prejudice persists, and once you once you legislate, then what you do is you generate more hostility, and also people feel, oh, we've done it, right? we've covered the, we've covered it, we have the legislation. Same thing, by the way, with education. It's not sufficient. Education is not sufficient. It has to be coupled with the encounter. There needs to be more encounter between people from different uh, different places in life. That's what the university used to be about. We have to reclaim the purpose of American higher education. I want to end with a story, Let's, and we'll take some questions. The story is a number of years ago. Uh, I got a call from one of my friends on campus, a professor who said, fine, what are you doing about what's going on? I said, what's going on? I didn't know what was going on. He said, well, the Arab students are on campus, and they've created a checkpoint. Oh, and the Jewish students are standing at the checkpoint with little slips of paper, and the slips of paper they give out to people, and they say, you're dead. It's because it's suicide bombing. So the Jews were being suicide bombers, and the Arabs were being checkpoint keepers and something or whatever and to show the awful side of each other so what do you do <laughs> what, what was i supposed to do so i went into the back room and i i say is there an oak tag here and no one and no one knew what oak tag was but i was looking for a big piece of a white cardboard and i wrote on it I, something like the following no to the occupation um no to violence yes to peace and i walked out on campus and i held up my sign and, every, and all the students looked at me and said, who's that old guy with all, all that white hair? I, I, I had, I, maybe I had a little more hair in those days. Um, and I tell you, my, my hands grew heavy. Uh, I'm not Moses, but I was trying to hold up the sign. All of a sudden, a student walks up to me and says, can I help you? I, wow, I said, please. And he took the other side. And then I said, uh, who are you? He said, well, uh, what's your name? George. I said, George, what do you study? Uh, electrical engineering. I'm a graduate student. He said, where are you from? And he said, Gaza. He says, I'm sick and tired of the extremists in my community. Right? That's what we have to do. We have to find each other. And we have to build the coalitions that are going to slice through the hatred and begin to build a new society of understanding. Questions, please. Well, I don't have a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm maybe gonna, have, maybe I'm gonna say hi and thank you. Complaints also accepted. Um, well, not not so much a complaint, but I want to I want to flag three things that I think also ought to be part of our our conversation. I commend you always for the conviction that you bring to everything that you share. Three things I want to raise. One is we can't lose sight of the fact that who Jewish students are has evolved tremendously on two important fronts. Mm -hmm. One is politically and the other is racially and ethnically. When we say Jewish students today, right. more of them look like me than look like Matt, who was my student. You're right. And we have, we have yet to grapple with what will Jewish spaces look like, multicultural spaces look like, university contexts look like, with a general multiculturalification, that's not a word, but I made it up, um, of all of the entire student body is changing before our very eyes. And the university is certainly not prepared to deal with it, but the Jewish community is also not prepared. And and moments like these are, are testing us and we're failing. So uh, by the way, Daniel, let me say something about that. What I've said for years, I, not, I, and I agree with you, thank you for that correction and, and for helping me in that way. But also, look, the, 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 the neighborhood changed 
many years ago. That was a thing. The whole the, the university, what the university that all these uh, alumni are complaining about. We we grew up. We got our degrees here. We went to Wharton and we went to Harvard. Those were different times. It was a very different university. It was lily white. It was elite, right? And and uh, people shared the same language, the same values. The university began to change in very active ways in the seventies and eighties, and 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 certainly in the nineties. Uh, you know, multiculturalism did bring different populations. And what needs to be done when you change the neighborhood, then what about asking the different neighbors to get to learn about one another? Because people don't know about one another and people are accustomed to certain style of living, different ways of, of, of seeing the world. And we, we didn't do that. We just right. didn't do that. We failed. In right. that Next. And and to that point, just, you know, you, you gave dates as, as an example. I started school in 2007 and back in those days, you didn't, you know, Facebook was just getting started unless you legitimately knew someone else who was going to the university that you were going to and you selected each other. You had no idea who your roommate was going to be. Now there are whole Facebook groups for incoming freshman class to find basically themselves right. in a group to room with. So you're not even getting an encounter in a dorm room the way that you used to. I had not a clue who my roommate was going to be. I had a name and no way of figuring out who she was. And that was it. I showed up in my dorm room and was like, are you Jade? Sure. Cool. Right. So I think that is, that is also really dramatically shifted. It's not just the, the toxicity of, of um, social media that has made things worse, but it's, it's the curation of people's lives in alignment with an echo chamber that reinforces who they are in the world that is just making it impossible for even minimal levels of encounter to it ha to happen, let alone normalization across lines of significant difference. So I just throw that in there as a date. Excellent. Probably Excellent. 2004, but it, you know, whatever. I went to school yeah. in 2007. Right. But, but, the, but the, the other piece that's changing about our student demographics is where they align politically as it relates to Israel. And in part, I agree with you. I think we did this to ourselves. The, the the hesitation around J Street as a Jewish student group gave rise to, if not now, which now gave rise to, I mean, Jewish Voices for Peace has always been around, but their pervasiveness right now on campus is because the Jewish community was was too scared to hey. allow hey. A, a wide enough tent for a place like J Street, which now I think most people would be like, are you kidding? Welcome, right? And, and But our failure to do so 20 years ago, 25 years ago, is what birthed the current rhetoric that you're seeing right now from Jews and right. and the the splintering of our community towards those poles and I I don't know what to do about that but I I I I don't know that we're going to reckon with it and say we were wrong but I do think it it's not talked about enough and and the third piece which is well, just, let me let me say a word about that uh, Danielle about that yeah. my, my great fear is. That we have a, a group, I don't know how large it is, of young Jews who want to divorce from Israel. Of course. What they want is a Judaism. They want to be Jewish, but they don't want Israel. That's right. And and they actually have a leader. I'm sorry, he's a friend of mine, but he's sort of the ideologue of this movement, and that's Peter Beinart. He's very articulate. He's very committed Jewishly, and he he's a model of a person who lives in an Orthodox world, and he um, has distanced himself significantly, significantly from Israel in a way in which, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, he's a personal friend and, and I don't want to, but 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 because it, it, I, I mean, I, I never imagined in my life that I would see that. It's one thing, you know, to be neutral, not, not to be a Zionist. I mean, but it's something else where you sort of want to somehow, uh, what you're saying is that uh, Israel taints my identity as a Jew. Right. And therefore I need to separate myself Right. And, there, and there's a significant body of Jews who are moving in that direction. And we don't have a compelling intellectual, educational, psychological, social, emotional space to wrestle with that without getting labeled anti-Zionist. No, and what, what, what do you mean? Self-hating. That's what they call it. Right, exactly. That's, exactly. That's, that's, when someone calls someone self-hating, I think you'd say, I want to understand what, what, you, what, what bothers you. Self-hating doesn't mean anything. It's a label. Why are you antagonized by this person's uh, politics? What is it about it that's a problem? Let's talk about it. Maybe it'll bring some understanding. Or maybe you'll learn something from their criticism. God forbid. God forbid. Yeah.
My my third thing is just as a as a American historical note that I think communally we need to contend with because white Jews are having a different experience in this country and have had been having a different experience in this country for decades is is you have to go all the way back to the GI bill and and what Jews and Jewish communities said yes to while other communities were not mm-hmm. afforded the same mm-hmm. options. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's not just that all of a sudden we became white because you know, of proximity to whiteness and and things of that sort. There were systemic institutional choices made by Jews as in, white Jews as individuals and by Jewish organizations, right? It's not an accident. And we don't have to say sorry for doing it or, or more accurately, you all don't have to say sorry for, so don't have to say sorry for doing it, but we do have to reckon with it and we do right. have to acknowledge it. We do have to own it. It's not an accident that this happened and, and we, and we can't, we can't shy away from that. So I just want to leave with a recommendation of a book called Black pa- Back, Black Power Jewish Politics by Mark Dollinger. Yes. It wrestles with some of these ideas really poignantly and is self-critical of a book itself because it failed to acknowledge the experiences of Jews of color in its entirety. And he um, is now on like a second round book tour owning that. So, right. um, he's so just, he, I think he's written, a new, he's written a new book that's about the ca- campus conflict. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, okay. I, I, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you you're going to give the next talk, uh, Danielle. So. Not a chance, but I <laughs> yes, love you. We, we, have to go, we have to go to the next generation. Uh, I, 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 I mean, it's, it's already a little bit after 7.30, but let's take one more question, if it's okay with you. Anyone? If, if there's anyone? Oh, okay. So, I, I mean, I hope I hope that this has been in some ways helpful i i uh, i and i and i and i hope that um that we'll be motivated actually to raise these issues um and it, let, let me say one thing it's really important that people who care about israel and who care about i mean care about the campus um but but in general who are who are active in jewish life that we'll be able to express our criticism along with our love. And we need to feel the embrace of the, the embrace of the critics. It's not, it, we, it shouldn't be experienced as a rejection because it's difficult. It's a very difficult time and people feel on edge and they're, and, and, and they're not trusting any longer. They're, they're, they're right, there's a great deal of mistrust here that's crept in. So, but, if we want to make a difference, we have to be able to step out uh, and not fall back into the cocoon, the comfortable cocoon of we have to take care of ourselves because nobody else cares about us. That's that that that's that's self-destructive because we know in this world that the only way that that groups are going to survive is if we begin to care for one another. Right. That that's that's just a reality, and the best times that we've had. I thank God, I, and I'm looking at some friends here, Rowan, who are, who are listening in. We grew up in the best times of America. And, and we grew up in a time where we actually had a sense that we were part of a whole and that we joined together with others in, 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 in the protest movements. Uh, and, we made, and we made some changes. And all of a sudden, that America has collapsed on us. Uh, and, and there's no leadership. And there's no leadership. So we need a new generation of leaders who believe in a new reality. So thank you, and to be continued, we'll continue next week with a little bit of learning. Shalom, shalom. Many thanks, Sir Chaim. Please join us again uh, a week from today, same time, same link. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Sonia. Bye bye, Melissa. Bye bye, my my friend. I see Susan. Yeah.